I took an original watercolour painting by polar explorer Edward Adrian Wilson. This amazing image depicts an isolated figure holding up a hurricane lamp in a wild Antarctic snowstorm during the fateful Terra Nova expedition to the South Pole in 1912. I scored an original orchestral setting in response to this incredible image titled On the Way to the Meteorological Screen. Here it is in a combined performance played by a five-piece ensemble alongside a percussion improvisation by Mark Sanders and with readings by Adam Horowitz from Edward Wilson's Expedition Diaries. These diaries offer a compelling and atmospheric alternative and a text that holds a starker and much more bleak reality. It is difficult to say how the days go in the pack ice. One has so many odd things to do, such as examining distant seals, penguins, and birds with the glasses to say what they are, drawing icebergs at critical moments and various distances, putting in an hour now and then below to make a watercolor sketch, then turning to the skinning of penguins. The bodies are wanted for dinner, then flensing seal skins and cleaning the meat off skulls and skeletons and dozens of other things. Tuesday, 21st February. The light was bad today. There was no wind. We got too near in towards White Island and found ourselves running over irregular ice, snow drifts alternating with weathered blue ice surfaces, the sort of stuff that I knew would be creviced. I knew from the noise under my foot that every now and then we were crossing rotten lidded crevasses. My foot went through and I leapt onto my sledge and I saw my leading dog at the same moment scramble. Then I suddenly saw the whole team disappear, one dog after another, as they ran down a crevasse in the barrier surface. Ten out of thirteen dogs disappeared as I watched. They looked exactly like rats running down a hole, only I saw no hole. They simply went into the white surface. I saw Scott running alongside and quickly jumping onto the sledge, and I saw Mears jam on the brake. I fixed mine and ran over to see what had really happened. The long trace hung in a loop down the crevasse, and from it the remainder of the team in harnesses, whining and yapping, trying to get a foothold on each other and on the crumbly snow and on the sides of the crevasse. Tuesday, 4th April. Bad weather all day, no going out. I made a new blubber lamp and we had long talks. Plenty of fun over a fry made in my new penguin lard. It was quite a success. Tasted like very bad sardine oil. Monday, 10th April. It snowed thick all day and cleared only for a beautiful sunset when I went up Observation Hill and sketched until it was dark. The light was wonderful, and the silence and stillness were absolute out there. Thursday, 13th April. Darned socks all afternoon and after lunch went up second crater with Cherry to see what the ice had done and make sure that the other party hadn't been cut off. It was all right. We had arranged that they should fire coloured lights at 10pm for three nights after their arrival. And sure enough, this evening we saw their lights and we signalled back with a flare of paraffin and tarred felt. Here, we have come to the end of our sugar today. We have also finished our flour, so we can't make chapatis. 
We've also finished our oatmeal, but we have lots of seal meat and biscuits and cocoa. Butter is running out, but we can't starve. And we are a very happy party of bohemians. Our clothes are soaked in seal blubber and soot, black and greasy, and we are all very dirty. Saturday, 22nd April. In comfort once more. The hut is a very different thing now to what it was when we left it in January. Gas jets, stoves, clotheslines, clocks, telephones, electric gadgets, and scientific apparatus everywhere, all in full working order. Sonny Jim, Day, and Nelson have been busy with their combined genius and have made a first class job of things. Saturday 29th, Saturday, 29th April. I drew a rough sketch, I drew a rough sketch a few arch days arch before the arch I fell in with a mighty crash. The icebergs make, the icebergs make weird noises on a still day. The icebergs make weird noises on a still day. periodic rolling and sort of aeolian humming and sighing. And a periodic rolling and throbbing and slow ice against the bird. All made by the rubbing of the flow ice against the bird. Sunday 30th April, a storm came, a storm up, came up, Sunday 30th April, the straight and straight storm rapidly freezing, freezing over again, the last, the last days straight days rapidly freezing over again, the large sheets the last sheets come up the center of the straight and up, there is large sheets there is water come up the center of the straight point to Turtle Rock, there is water now and up to Glacier Tun, hut point to Turtle Rock, and up to Glacier Tun. Monday, 8th May. Things always turn out for the best, and generally in a way different to what one expects. Sunlight at midnight is perfectly wonderful. One looks out upon endless fields of broken ice, all violet and purple in the low shadows, and all gold and orange and rose red in the broken edges which catch the light, while the sky is an emerald green and pink. And these two beautiful tints are reflected in pools of absolutely still water which here and there lie between the ice floes. We now have broad daylight, night and day, but the beauty of the day, with its lovely blues and greens amongst the bergs and ice floes, is eclipsed altogether by the beauty of midnight, when white ice becomes deepest purple. Wednesday, 17th January. We camped on the pole itself at 6.30 p.m. this very evening. In the morning, we were up at 5 a.m. and got away on the Norwegian tracks going south-southwest for three hours, passing two small cairns and then finding their tracks too snowed up to follow. We made our own beeline to the pole. It was difficult to keep one's hands from freezing in double woolen and fur mittens. Oats, Evans and Bowers all have severe frostbitten noses and cheeks, and we had to camp early for lunch on account of Evans' bad hands. It was full of crystals driving towards us as we came south, making the horizon grey and thick and hazy. We hope for clear weather. But in any case, are all agreed that he can claim prior right to the pole itself. He has beaten us insofar as he made a race of it. From his tracks, we think there were only two men on ski with plenty of dogs. They seem to have had an oval-shaped tent 
Cigarettes have been smoked and much appreciated by Scott and Oates. Sunday, 4th February. Evans is feeling the cold, getting badly frostbitten. Titus's toes are blackening and his nose and cheeks are a dead looking yellow. Dressing Evans's fingers every other day with boric Vaseline. His hands are quite sweet still. Monday, 5th February. We had a difficult day getting in amongst the frightful chaos of broad, chasm-like crevasses. We bore west a bit and got on better all the afternoon and got round a good deal of the upper disturbance of the falls here. Evans's fingers suppurating, nose very bad and extremely rotten looking. The land is well in sight today. The falls are all formed or have large open crevasses. Friday, 16th February. All afternoon, the weather became thicker and thicker. After three and a quarter hours, Evans collapsed. He was giddy and unable to walk even by the sledge, so he camped here. Evans' collapse has much to do with the fact that he has never been sick in his life and is now helpless with his bad hands. Saturday, 17th February. He had fallen and his hands frostbitten. And we returned for the sledge and skid him out as he was rapidly losing the use of his legs completely. He was comatose by the time we got him into the tent and he died without recovering that night at 10 p.m.